Okay, uh, good morning, Hugo, again. Uh, thank you very much to, uh, to volunteer to uh, do this uh, presentation today, share your research with everybody. Um, the idea is uh, to, to learn from uh, our professors during this time where, um, you know, we are forced to work uh, with this type of technology. However, I believe that we can take advantage of this technology and, and, and this situation to have this kind of webinars um, with uh, professors from Yachay Tech, uh, professors outside Yachay Tech in Ecuador and uh, in the world. So um, we need to take this, these opportunities. Um, and thank you again, Hugo, uh, to do this presentation. Um, please, uh, you can start. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Frank, and thank you for the invitation. Um, this time I wanted to share with you uh, a little of the advancements and, and our future ideas uh, regarding a project that we started at Yachay Tech back in 2015. Uh, originally among some of the professors that were here back then. Uh, but then um, I was kind of left alone in the project, but uh, I thought it was a, a project that we had to keep going. Also to give uh, some identity, some research identity to the Yachay Botanical Garden, which at the time we were just starting. So I'm going to talk about uh, what uh, we have done in terms of uh, ex situ and in situ conservation of this Indian tuber, which is called Oxalis tuberosa here in Ecuador called the Oca, and which is a, a tuber that uh, is in the last decades, even though it is a native tuber, people have not, you know, the consumption of this tuber uh, has been reduced among, among people. This project, uh, of course, uh, you always collaborate and it is because uh, it is uh, uh, actually an agricultural oriented project. So I, from the very beginning, I recruit uh, with the support of the university um, uh, two persons that were uh, agricultural engineers. At the beginning was Alex Cabrera and then also lately Michaela Navarrete, who as you know, later uh, became a member of our faculty. So um, let's start. Let's first introduce this little plant. Uh, let me first ask the audience, have you heard about the oka? Have you seen the plant? Have you eaten? I don't know if anyone can answer that. If you turn on your microphones. Anyone? Is there anyone in the audience that has eaten oka? Yo la he comido, sí, está muy rica. Sí, okay, that's uh, our friend uh, Javier. Anyone else? Yes, me. I have okay. eaten. Okay. What about the rest? Well, you see, um, yeah, you see, when you ask these these questions to people, usually it becomes a little bit strange because. Often uh, what you see is that, you know, very low percentage of people, maybe two, 30%, two, 20 to 30% of the people actually have eaten the oka in their lives. But when you go to the rural areas, a lot of people have eaten this. I mean, this is still widely consumed in, by the indigenous people. But for us, city people, it has become a kind of a, that it is associated actually with uh, it has replaced it or it has not uh, it has been replaced by other types of foods to begin with potato right and and potato of course uh, there are so many varieties and things but we have forgotten about this tuber which back in the 50s 50 years ago it was actually the second most consume in Ecuador and actually you know 500 years ago before the Spaniards arrived 
it was very, very widely consumed. And just to share with you some, some facts uh, that we have read about, this tuber was actually often given as a gift to the Spaniards, to the conquerors. Uh, uh, so it was special in the indigenous culture. And when analyze the Oka, actually, as I will show you, it is it has some uh, properties that uh, are, I think, lately have been undervalued. And this uh, fact we know of, uh, there are publications about that, but uh, it's still uh, the, the jump, to jump from a rural consumption to a more wide consumption upon the population has been a challenge or has been a challenge. So um, what's the name, scientific name of, of this plant? It is Oxalis tuberosa. It was described by a Jesuit who was called, uh, his last name was Molina. This is back in the 1700s. Um, where does it grow? Well, it actually grows in, from approximately, you know, from 2,025, meters up to 4,000 meters depending on in terms of the soil conditions actually it is very flexible I we was reading that it can sustain um, from 5 to 7 uh, pH uh, in terms of the soil which is uh, relatively wide uh, uh, conditions for pH and in terms of the rain, also well, of course, the plant does not want to have uh, more rain and it is maturing with less rain or for the too. Uh, so, but still it is uh, accustomed to many, to many regimes of soil and rainfall regimes. Um, in terms of the ploidy, in terms of the genetics here, uh, I have uh, I have uh, read, or we have. Uh, Hugo, sorry to interrupt you. Sometimes we we don't hear you well, so maybe it's better to try to the video that most. Often it has ploidy uh, of it's an so you have you know it's really yeah, so let me turn to the video. Connection. Yeah, it's all good, Hugo. Okay, okay, because I got a message that I lost my internet and then it is here. Okay, so I just came back. In terms of the octoploid, uh, it is an octoploid, right? Uh, which actually it is a complicated situation because to understand the genetics of an octoploid, you know, a plant that has uh, eight uh, sets of chromosomes. Um, it is a challenge and actually it is one of the things we would like to do in the future in collaboration with some geneticists. Uh, but sometimes uh, the ploidy can change. Uh, there are reports that sometimes it is pentaploid or a hexaploid. So why do you have this? Because the origin of this plant actually is, is a hybrid. Uh, Hugo, sorry, we don't see your PowerPoint. Ah, okay. So, yeah, actually. Let me see. Let me see if I get if I get the controls. Uh, the controls of the zoom. Oh, I, I got us.
How is that? Yeah, it's perfect to go. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, um, uh, where was I? Um, I was talking about the ploidy, right? And then, uh, so the ploidy is, uh, you got these eight uh, sets of sets of chromosomes. It, why sometimes you got uh, also reports that it is an hexaploid or pentaploid chromosome? And what is this? Well, you got to remember. We have to remember that it, uh, the origin of this uh, oxalis tuberosa, the domesticated plants, it actually is coming from hybrid hybrid between wild uh, species. And there are some hypotheses of where what parental species are the are the origin of this oxalis tuberosa, but the story his, it seems a little bit complex uh, because uh, you actually, when you take all the variability within the oxalis tuberosa, within the tuber, uh, you find that uh, there could be a, a number of options, a number of hybridizations through time <clears throat> that allow <clears throat> this, uh, this plant to actually become very diverse. So, it seems like the latest, the latest um, approach is that we consider this plant a uh, species complex. And what is a species, species complex? It's just that, you know, you got a species that so much variation, uh, but they all kind of uh, share a number of characteristics, but it's still um, we're not sure whether they are actually different. So we call this a species complex. Um, and also, it is important to realize about the breeding system of the Octalis tuberosa. Um, Beginning with, uh, well, this is the flower, you know, from very nice flower, bee pollinated. Uh, but it turns out that when the flowers actually grow, it is very rare to actually have fruit to see the fruit in the field it is not that common although it happens but it's not too common and it, people say uh, because of domestication actually this part of this life cycle of the plant has been kind of, of reduced it's often the, the flowers will fall and will not produce a fruit a very tiny capsule with in this case for example four little seeds and that's very that's not uh, common to see. And also, it is important to realize, uh, well, why is this? Because you know that the plant has been uh, vegetatively through tubers. That's how it, uh, it uh, is propagated. So the sexual reproduction is not uh, that common. It's still, sometimes you may have that, and, and there are publications that argue that because of sexual reproduction, when you get sexual reproduction, you get uh, varieties, you know, you get tubers that look a little bit different, and then these are uh, selected uh, by, by people. Uh, it's important also to realize the breeding system. Breeding system, it is also not a typical plant. It turns out that it has an auto incompatibility system, people say. So what does that mean? It just means that it doesn't want to to uh, fertilize among uh, flowers that look like in terms of their anatomy. Or self-fertilization to begin with, it is really rare. And why is that? Well, basically it's because you have three types of flowers, usually in a population. Uh, you get this, uh, depending on the, on the size of the female part, what the style we call, and this tri little triangle is just the stigma of the, of the style, the circles will be the ovary of the flower. So you have small flowers, medium-sized flowers, and large flowers. And, and the, the style here, the, the height where the stigma is, it varies, right? And then you'll have the stamens, right? Here is the stamens, this, it is just the answer where the pollen is. You also have variation in the size of the stamens. And uh, it turns out that only that 
when you, in nature, when you have a statement that is, that has, a, for example, this statement here, it will only, uh, with the answer here, it will only get to pollinate those stigmas, those stigmas that will receive the pollen from this, uh, from this anther will only be those that have, uh, that are the same size. You can see the arrows, it's just indicating what uh, stigmas are receptive of the pollen. And that really limits uh, cross uh, a little bit of outcrossing because um, it, it is not only a matter that the bee takes the pollen to the other flower and that's the end of the story. It's also a, a matter of whether your stigma is receptive depending where it came from. Uh, depending on the answer that it came from. So it is that uh, gives a, a, it is, a, you know, complicated therefore to get, as I said, fruits. So moving on, people always wonder, okay, why, uh, how important can be this tuber for the nutrition of our people? And there are many, actually, publications, depending where you are, uh, we got to remember that nowadays uh, we, we, we have uh, tubers of oca not only in the Andes, but it has also uh, arrived to England, for example, and in the 60s, uh, uh, there was a boom of planting oca in New Zealand, actually in New Zealand, they call it the New Zealand yam, uh, well, it happens. Uh, and, um, People are, are always, uh, you know, depending on the variety, you get different uh, values. But back uh, actually in the 90s, there was a big project about uh, that was called the uh, Raices y Tuberculos Andinos, Indian Roots and, and, and Tubers of the Andes. Um, that was, uh, you know, a big project that uh, INIAP, our Institute of Research for Agriculture, was part of that and they got a uh, uh, they made uh, uh, some assessments of uh, the nutrition uh, in Oka and also the diversity of Oka in our in our country. <clears throat> and um, this data, they are just averages, averages, and this is from them. You realize that it has a lot of carbohydrates, right? Uh, that's above 80 percent, 80%, eighty-eight percent, or something like that. And that's about as potato can have. So in terms of carbohydrates, uh, you know, it's just like potato, a lot. You also get some fiber and and some protein, but uh, compared to the to other types of tubers of, of the Andes, like mejoco or miso or zanahoria blanca, akira, you know, they are all roots or jicama or mashua. Uh, actually, if the most striking feature is that you really accumulate, it does have a lot of uh, energy in terms of carbohydrates. Um, and just like potato, so it could very well uh, compete with potato if there was a market for it, a more larger market than it has now. But then, of course, it's not only about having proteins and that. Let me just project this. Are you still looking at the screen? I was afraid to project this because I'm not sure if we will. Why, the, why did I lose a little bit of connection last time? I think you're looking at it. I got a chat here. I always don't like to see the chat. Okay, thank you, Marcus. All right. So let's look a little bit about uh, the nutrition uh, uh, more in detail. This is, again, is data of the uh, from uh, INIAP, right, back then in the 90s, at the end of the 90s. And uh, here they compared different uh, Indian cultivars, including Oka, right? Some of these you might be familiar with. And so I know it is a lot of data, so let's look at it a little bit slower, okay? Just to kind of capture um, uh, the, the details here. Okay, let me see if this works. Okay, there you go. So let's look at the protein. 
Uh, as I said, okay, it is not like a big deal of protein. It's not like mejoco, for example. Many of you have eaten, you know, it has a lot of protein. Roca is okay. I mean, it is uh, a value of 4.6. These are, these are averages. You know, it's not like mashua or mejoco, but I mean, it is okay in terms of the protein. Now, as I already told you, in terms of the carbohydrates, then that's a lot, 88%. That's uh, as much as potato can have. Uh, depending on the variety, it could be even more. But then you go to the nutrients, right? To the elements. And look at this uh, uh, phosphorus, right? In terms of phosphorus, although you may have, uh, for example, mashua, right? Or a chira with very high values, a value of 0.14 percentage of phosphorus, it's, it's not bad for, for a tuber. And in terms of potassium, same story. Is not, it does have uh, some, uh, you know, relatively decent values, I would say. But look at uh, in terms of iron, same story, right? You do not have as high iron, for example, as Zanahoria Blanca, that has a lot of iron and a cheetah. But still, you know, you get a value that is not too low either. But then, Look at this, and, and that's why I put in red. Look at this value of the iodine value. Now, iodine, iodide, iodide, right? It's, uh, as, as we all know, right? It is a very important nutrient, right? For example, to make a, to, for the thyroid, and avoid this, right? Avoid the, to make our thyroid gland work okay. And that, look at that, it has 3.65 per million and that is a lot more than, have, than the other uh, Indian tubers have and some of them actually have basically nothing and that I think by itself makes Oka a very crucial I would think um, input of nutrients for the consumption so we got to think in order to, to put again the Oka on our place we got to to look for strategies that allows us to actually sell uh, the oka more than it is uh, it is now okay so in terms of starch almidon right again almidon of course just uh, part of the total carbohydrates again you have a lot right and not not a lot but you know decent values and then when you get to vitamin c now, vitamin C, same uh, story, although, of course, mashua, very famous mashua, it will have very high values of vitamin C. Well, Oka, it is second, right? It is with a value of 34. Uh, it's not that bad. It has a relatively good content of vitamin C. And uh, when you get to vitamin A1, uh, which is uh, retinol, right? Actually, this is strange in this uh, data set that they do not report any value for, for retinol, vitamin A1. Uh, but in other publications, they report that uh, the OCA may also uh, have a good values for vitamin A. And of course, because it is, uh, it is from this family of salidisi where all the plants from this family accumulate oxalates, Right, they taste bitter, right? Uh, it, it has a lot uh, of oxalate. And some people worry, all, all sometimes I have heard that, oh yeah, I do not consume oka because it has a lot of oxalates and I'm not sure if it would be good for health. We got to remember that, of course, maybe if you consume every day, you may get uh, some kidney stones, right, develop because of the oxalate, uh, the precipitates. Uh, but, uh, we got to remember that, for example, spinach, you know, the spinach that we buy in the market, it has way more, much, much more oxalate acids in, in the leaves. And not only that, but there are other foods that we tend to consume sometimes that also accumulate uh, by nature a lot of um, oxalic acids. For example, chocolate. Plain chocolate, I guess not to process, uh, has a lot also, much more than Oka uh, 
oxalic acid. So even though sometimes the people I have heard people saying, oh, it tastes too bitter. Actually, if you put it under the sun, you get rid of the bitterness of the tuber, uh, or you just let it mature a little bit more. But uh, the idea that uh, because it is uh, too bitter, it, it has too much oxalate, I don't think it has good support. Uh, we got other foods in our daily diet that also provide or have a lot of oxalate. And, and of course, if you consume too much oxalate, it might be a little bit difficult for the kidney. But I think it's okay. Um, so why, oh, you may be asking why didn't, why don't we taste the oxalate in chocolate, right? Well, it depends on the chocolate. Sometimes they are a little bit bitter, right? But I think you have other compounds that are actually hiding the bitterness of chocolate and, and uh, spinach as well when you cook. Then they're there, that, that's it, right? The spinach, uh, a lot of it just goes away. Um, okay, so now uh, getting to know a little bit more of this tuber, and before we tell you about what we have done, uh, it is important to realize the importance of genetic diversity. And in the terms of the OCA, as you can see, you have a lot of different varieties of OCA. You can have those very white ones, the yellow ones, sometimes with some little uh, traces of red, right? You have the those that are kind of pinkish, and then you sometimes you get a very purple or even black. I don't see anyone any black here. But, uh, sometimes you sometimes you have a, a black, almost black uh, tubers. And um, all these have been uh, through artificial selection by our indigenous people uh, for many thousands of years. Actually, we get all the remains in uh, in archaeological settings. Uh, back from 8,000 and sometimes uh, there are even reports or, or extrapolations that say even 10,000 years ago, but let's say 8,000. 8,000 years ago, uh, people already in the Andes uh, were cultivating oca. Or well, it's starting, I think, it's starting to domesticate it. So uh, we got all these varieties and, and it is uh, important to maintain this genetic diversity. Now I'm going to ask the audience just to kind of make this a little bit more interactive. Um, and I need note a lot of students are in, why should we conserve or try to conserve uh, as much genetic diversity as possible? Can anyone please um, participate? Why is it important to, to worry about this? No one? <clears throat> well, there are many advantages of conserving genetic diversity. And so, well, what, uh, in especially when you face uh, the future, that the future is always unknown, it is usually better to have uh, the genes where you can actually, you know, that you can count with in order to face the conditions of climatic conditions uh, or in environmental conditions that can actually challenge you to adapt. You know, climate is always changing and uh, you get, and more so now, right? So when you get a good genetic diversity uh, in general, an organism, an organism can be better prepared to face these environmental challenges that at the end they represent a selection forces, right? Agents of selection. But selection needs to act on variability, as you very well know. And if you do not have variability in the population, then selection cannot act. And you are doomed to extinction, basically. So you need to have genetic variation in order for selection to act and in order for survive in the long term as a species or to evolve or to change, right? So it is important. And uh, what uh, 
it is an important treasure right for to maintain and more so for these domesticated uh, plants so you may be asking well how on earth uh, the genetic diversity appear um, of course right it is through evolution right through selection it could be natural selection right or artificial selection by, by humans um, but uh, I, in practice, right, uh, what you can just kind of organize in the, the concepts, I think we can organize them into three groups of factors. Especially speaking of how uh, diversity can be maintained. You got, of course, the genetics, right, within the plants, or the genotypes that eventually express phenotypes, right? But because we're talking about a domesticated uh, tuber, domesticated plant, you also have the effect of humans, right? The anthropological factors here. And by anthropological factors, I am including, of course, a part of anthropology in the broad sense, uh, agricultural practices, right? All these ethnographic practices that actually have an effect on the, on the tuber and the diversity of the tuber. And then, um, also ecology when you put ecology into the game people sometimes don't think about this these ecological factors and how they are interplaying with the genetic factors but actually when you put uh, ecological factors into the game you can understand better the processes that have affected the evolution of a plant or an organism and you get into the realm of what people say evolutionary ecology Um, so, uh, what is evolutionary ecology? Well, that's uh, basically what, what you want to do is you want to understand how different uh, phenotypes and therefore genotypes uh, are being affected by different agents of natural selection or, uh, yeah, right, in nature, and how is that uh, affecting the, the fitness, right? of the crop the relative fitness at the end of this plant or of the crop because sometimes we think that it is only the humans that are exerting an effect on the genetics of of, of this tuber but it is i am pretty sure you also got ecological uh, settings that allow uh, you know that kind of limit or interplay with this for example you, you can always imagine that there, there are probable varieties, probably there are varieties of, of oca that will uh, survive or will uh, sustain the climate change more better than other varieties. Uh, you know, maybe they are better, uh, have the genes to, to support uh, higher temperatures in the environment. And that uh, climate change uh, at the end, uh, it will exert, it is an ecological, right, a fact, a climate that will affect this uh, diversity. So you had this interplay. Now, I kind of organized it like that because it was one idea I had in order to organize the literature that I was compiling or that we have been compiling about this, this uh, system. And it turns out that when you look at the bibliography, you know, what people publish, well, you realize that, uh, you know, uh, these are approximate numbers, really. Of course, you cannot have every publication. You keep looking, you keep finding things, but this is just kind of an uh, trend. And so just notice that everyone, most people are worried about the genetics within populations and among populations, right? You got 15 uh, studies about that, and only one in Ecuador back in 2002. Uh, using the molecular techniques back then, uh, the, the Institute of Agriculture kind of assessed the genetic diversity in their collection. And of course, people also worry about the humans, how humans are, are managing this cultivar. You got like eight in this case, and two studies in Ecuador. But you, joining genetics with anthropology, you got three studies, only one in Ecuador. But then when you think about ecology, look at that. It is an empty spot. Uh, and, and, and I think very little has been done in terms of evolutionary ecology. For example, when you do these transplant uh, experiments, for example, that you plant 
in different, let's say, altitudes or environmental conditions, uh, plants, populations that originally were not from there, but you do the same thing with other populations. You kind of mix things together, transplanting. You do not have any of that, basically. Uh, or, or even common garden experiments, right? That, uh, people just, uh, you know, have all the varieties of all kinds, one single place in a single environment and just assess uh, how they develop uh, under the same environmental conditions or control of environmental conditions. And uh, that's all evolutionary ecology, and basically it is an empty, an empty spot. Uh, we, we still have uh, need to have uh, a lot of information about that. And I think it's basically a historical uh, thing because people think it's a crop and they think it is out of ecology. Well, uh, crops are also part of the ecological system, right? And they have pollinators and everything. So I think we need to think about. Uh, for crops management, uh, think more about ecology. Well, but this is in Latin America, right? In other places, it's a different story. Okay, so that was that was genetic diversity, kind of finding it and and thinking about how it originates and how it is maintained. But this genetic diversity we need to protect. How do we protect? Well, we can uh, basically his, people have organized themselves into two strategies. We have a conservation that is in situ in the, in the proper habitat, right? And you also have ex situ conservation, which is uh, out of the habitat. And in our country, uh, you, we only have the collections from INIAP. INIAP has around 90 uh, accessions in their seed bank. They are all in vitro. Sometimes they take, it, they take them out from the in vitro collection. And uh, then that's all we have, and then in the field. And so by the beginning of the project, we thought it would not be bad uh, to have uh, also contribute to this exit to conservation efforts from Yache Botanical Garden by creating also our, our kind of a seed bank or a germ plasm bank, right? With the varieties of all of the country, but not yet in vitro, that's something we want to do in the future. So let's uh, just keep going a little bit faster. How, when you do these seed banks or gerplus banks, look at uh, Ecuador, right? Look at the, the number of accessions in, in Ecuador. This is 2006 data. It's only 135 accessions. And that represented around 20 morphotypes. Now, this just goes to show that, uh, you know, in contrast, a, a country like Peru, where I think they are valuing more this OCA. Than, than us, they really are into it. I mean, they have above 1,000 accessions. And from their uh, classification, you know, there are different classifications of morphotypes, so you cannot really compare these numbers, but maybe they are kind of, they, they might be just genotypes. They have above 700 morphotypes, different kinds of organs. That's a lot. I think they are thinking more about the genetics, the, the, than the and actually the, the phenotype. Um, but they still, you know, compared to Bolivia, same story. They got like 500 in their seed banks. And here, here we have, you know, little really. So, I think, you know, we, we, we could do more about that. And that's what we wanted to do. So these approaches that you have for conservation in C2 by the people themselves and also at C2 in the in the Germplans banks, actually, they are all connected. If you want to do real conservation efforts, you have to connect all these conservation approaches. And also what people call nowadays quasi in situ. <clears throat> quasi in situ just means that you are creating something like what they are calling here, Jardín de Conservación, conservation garden that is located in the same area, in the same habitat as the as the local population of plants, right? But it is a garden that is maintained by the locals, by the local people. Uh, so that will be a quasi in situ conservation effort. Uh, and that, of course, it is connected, right? Ideally, you will, you will want to have backups of those, all those things in an ex situ bank, right? And then everything just keeps connecting more from the from the sociological, anthropological uh, uh, 
dynamics, right, in which you organize these conservation fairs, seeth fairs, and of course the cultivars, so that the agricultural and that the farmers keep growing, and and everything just kind of connecting, connect uh, all these uh, all these efforts, right? There are parts here in this part here that you have here just an organized system here in this case is talking about selecting right the tubers and and then uh, they so are giving these tubers uh, to the people okay so that they keep maintaining them and this concept uh, of course it is a concept that was developed by INIAP they, they sometimes they try to well often they want to try to make this uh, happening in, for in real but the fact of the matter is, as many things in life, you know, there are many, many of these links sometimes are difficult to do, right, for a number of reasons. So now let's get into business. What have we done to help to protect this, this, uh, this interesting Indian tuber? So we have sample ocas throughout the country. Uh, we have uh, explored a as much as we can from Loja, from the southern tip of Ecuador, Archi to the northern tip of Ecuador, uh, just looking for uh, farmers, uh, indigenous peoples, or just campesinos that still keep oca in their fields. So let's say we find a person there, uh, we uh, do an approach, explain the project, what it's about, and then uh, create a little bit of, of, of rapport um, with the people, and then uh, voluntarily they will express whether they want to help us or not and uh, then we just start talking right let's sit down etc and uh, we start to talk about how they care of the tuber a number of questions that are the typical questions that you do uh, when you do this kind of studies, for example, of course, you ask, uh, you take graphic information, personal information, you ask how many varieties they know they still have, how many they used to have, uh, uh, where do they get the tubers from, right? Uh, how do they maintain the cultivar, where, what months they cultivate that, how do they take care of, that, of the cultivar, uh, if there are any any diseases that they have noticed, right? Uh, how do they select the tubers for the next uh, cycle, right? Uh, what do they do with the tubers? Do they eat the tubers? It's just for self-consumption. Do they sell them? What? Uh, how do they prepare? How do they cook the tubers? And things like that. So with all this information, right? Finally, you, you we ask them, right? If they could donate some of the tubers uh, to us, and we take this to the to our germplasm bank, at the garden. Now that this uh, this uh, system actually is something that we uh, it is very time consuming, but you end up with a lot of information. You record you record the interview with these people, and then uh, you have all these recordings uh, for to analyze then later on. It is kind of an open format uh, interview. Some, sometimes people talk about many other things, but you have kind of uh, some uh, guidelines uh, in terms of the questions. Um, so as of today, we have been in 188 sites in the country. Uh, that just means that we have visited uh, 108 families or persons, right? In the country and, and that's a map where we have been we still have to explore a little bit more of pichincha i left that at the by the end because i thought it was closer to us and maybe it was something like a weekend or one day uh, effort because we still need to finish a little bit of the sampling in, in that province but we have a lot and i think we have a very good representation uh, there are areas in the country that when you do not see a red dot, it doesn't mean that we have not been there. We have been there exploring all the Andes as much as we can. But actually, we, there are areas that we have not found any, any uh, cultivar of oca. People have stopped uh, planting oca tubers. So 
we have, what is the situation at the moment? Well, out of these 188 sites of persons, sometimes they have one, two, three, right? Um, different cultivars of oca. So for each one of them, each cultivar will, will represent an accession. So in total, actually, we have collected uh, 339 accessions. But uh, sometimes you collect things, but when you go to the exit to a work at the garden, uh, you know, things can happen. Sometimes they are just, uh, they, you, you lose the plant, either maybe it has a disease or maybe uh, because it didn't terminate, it was not viable, uh, different situations, right? Um, so we were, we have been able to germinate around 261 of those accessions. Yeah. Sometimes you do not bring covers. Sometimes you bring, uh, because it, the plant is not ready, you bring a whole plant with uh, earth um, and that's your collection, right? Because the tubers were just not ready in the fields for you to collect. In any case, uh, for those that germinated, we have uh, leaves collected, right, in silica gel and also we have them at minus 80 degrees in the freezer at the university. Um, and the idea with that would be, with those samples, would be to eventually at some point do a more in-depth genetic analysis. Now, as time goes by, uh, as much as we put the best of our efforts, uh, it is not that easy for a number of logistical reasons and, and also because of the environment to maintain live all those accessions. And that's why we would like to actually have a or start to have our, our accessions in vitro. Uh, so at the moment, we have like a uh, hundred accessions approximately that are still uh, alive and well in the situ collection. And maybe those are the ones that are actually uh, adapted or have the, the, the ability to adapt to these more um, uh, conditions of the garden, which is actually uh, an environment which is more warmer. So that's what uh, we do, right? Um, at the garden, it's not uh, high tech things, uh, but it is uh, it is a bank that is uh, we have been able to maintain over the years. So where have we collected, right? And how many how many morphotypes uh, we have had? Well, first of all, notice how many morphotypes. Uh, uh, we have, we have uh, from a preliminary classification, just looking at the phenotypes because the genetics is still out in the air. Um, we got around 11, 11 morphotypes from what we have been able to classify. And so they are uh, in different parts of the country, right? Uh, these are just provinces in, in our country, Indian provinces. And look at this one. This one is a uh, it's one that only it occurs in one province here in Cañar. So it is a unique, very unique uh, oca variety, you know. Um, let's look at another example. For example, let's look at this but one. Also. There are so many. Oh. Is there any questions? Okay. Genetic evidence. Each morphotype is. Yes. What, what is the question? Uh, no, no, then, then, then. <laughs> I, I, I think that you can, you can listen to me. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, so the genetics will, it's something that we want to do actually. So we will, you will have uh, this other situation in which we have other, another very rare variety and that also we were able to find it in the south of Ecuador and, and there's one collection in Chimborazo. So they might actually be different in terms of the genetics because they are far away, but they look very, very similar. And then you have things that are more common. For example, this number 10, look, the number 10 is all over Ecuador. And these are the ones that probably if you go to any market, you look and you find this number nine is another example. You find this typical, uh, you know, cream, uh, you know, whitish ocas that are very commonly sold. Uh, they tend to be more um, uh, stronger to maintain. And also they, 
the, the taste is a little bit less sour or less bitter. Uh, here is another uh, number 10 is another example of this uh, very common oka that we see. You know, if you go to Urkuki uh, in the market, uh, you know, near Yacha, you will find this. Um, so from our collections, in all these accessions that we have had, you know, of course, these are pictures that are fresh when, you, when we go and get back from the field. Uh, or we, or or sometimes we have been able to actually produce tubers in the garden, and we take pictures if we didn't have one. So, uh, what are the most common accessions? And of course, uh, it's the same story, right? Remember, we have uh, morphotype ten, and of course, that's what you have the highest number of accessions. The common one that was all over the country, all provinces. Number nine as well, and then. The rare ones, of course, you'd have a little accession. This is just another way of, of looking at the same data. Uh, as those two are like the most rare, right? Oka and the most common one, morphotype one and morphotype 10, respectively. Um, now, how much have we sampled in each province? Of course, it depends on uh, if you find or not uh, people cultivating okas. Uh, but uh, here is a very clear trend that our indigenous people in the provinces of Imborazo, Cotopaxi, Imbabura, and Ngurawa, we all know they have a very high indigenous population density. Um, they, uh, that's where we have the more, the more accessions from because we have more often found uh, people cultivating uh, orcas. So you just keep accumulating accessions. In other provinces, sometimes what has happened is that you really need to explore a lot in order to find a person that is still cultivates orca. Sometimes uh, you get kilometers and kilometers of in the Andes and, and you keep asking, 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 and they typically story as, oh, the story is, we used to plant that, but nowadays, because it is just so cheap in the market, we, we just are not planting anymore cultivating that anymore. And then sometimes you find this old lady or old man that is still, you know, just for self-consumption has a the oka being planting, planted in, in their little farm. So sometimes it, it really takes a, a lot of exploration and patience. And now how do we, how, when do we move on? That's another question you might be thinking of, about. Well, uh, it turns out that when you explore an area, after you collect the first okas, and after a while, after a couple of days, you start to see the same varieties again and again, even though they come from different persons or families, but you start to see uh, the same thing. So even though we collect a little bit at some point, uh, we kind of uh, stop collecting because uh, we kind of assume that we have all, all what, uh, what is there to see, but you never know really. Now, this is the most striking uh, pattern that I think if there is anything you got to remember from this talk, please remember this. Here is just uh, the number of morphotypes that we have uh, been able, that we have uh, data that are being cultivated by a farmer. Sometimes they maintain one cultivar, sometimes two, uh, up to five. No one in Ecuador has more than five cultivars in their in their land. Uh, even though when you ask them to how many how many oka varieties do you know or oka cultivars, they always tell you, okay, this one, this one, this one, this one, you know, four or five of they always know a lot, but what they maintain is typically one or two. And that's about you see 50% only one, one variety. You know, one 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 morphotype or variety or cultivar, right? Uh, like fifty percent of the farmers just maintain one, and then two. It's also like thirty percent that adds up to, you know, around eighty-five percent or so. Um, and the rest, uh, very few people have uh, more than that. And that means if the trend continues like that, what do you what you will have? You will end up with, with uh, I think, with a situation in which you lose a lot of uh, genetic diversity because people are just not planting a lot. 
um, a lot of varieties. And eventually we may be facing a situation of, of genetic erosion, right? Like losing genetic diversity. Okay, now, where do they get the, the orcas? Uh, we, that's part of the interviews and we have not yet analyzed all the interviews. We, we have been able to analyze like 52 of them out of the 188. Um, so where do they get that? Well, you, the, the pattern is very clear, like 75% of the farmers, it is actually a heritage from, from grandpa, from grandma, you know, that used to plant the ocas and these tubers that, uh, that in this case grandmother has, well, they are the same tubers that this family has been planting uh, over the years. And only, well, not only, but like 25% of the people, they actually have obtained the ocas by buying them in different parts. But it's interesting to know that a lot of this uh, cultivation of ocas, it is kind of a family, family heritage, uh, a custom of the family throughout the years. Uh, so it is the role of, of, of the elderly is crucial, right? Now, there, are, there is the situation, as we all know, of migration and, and, and not a lot of labor in our fields. So that's also a risk. As, as time passes, uh, and we have seen that already in some parts, uh, the young people do not work the lands anymore. So they could just go to the city or do something else. And that also represents a risk uh, in the medium term. Okay. Uh, now, because do not actually, you know, when you get ocas, it's not like a super pricey uh, thing that you can sell very good in the market. A lot of what people uh, produce, it's for self-consumption, like around 50% of the production just is consumed at home and the rest is uh, usually sold in the market and so forth. Okay, so what is the future? What we would like to do for the future? For the future, uh, of course, we, oh, yes. Sorry to, to interrupt you a little bit. Is, is 11? Uh, I don't know if you have a, a couple of uh, very yeah. night that you uh, This is the last discuss. part. Yeah, this is just the last part. Um, just to tell you what we would like to do in the future, um, finish some of the sampling. And of course, we need to take care more of our management in at the Ache Botanical Garden. And um, there, I think we still have now enough data to publish about the ethnographics uh, or agronomic data for, for, for the, of the OCAS. And we keep looking for funding. Uh, we, every year we, we look for funds. We have not been, been that lucky always. Uh, but now we are trying, trying to apply to, for example, the ICGAV. And especially one, one empty, one thing that is important is to do the genetic analysis and also the in vitro collection. And also this, there is those, all those, this uh, wild relative uh, uh, system because in order to understand the evolution of orcas, you need to have, or to have breeding material for the future, you need to have also a collection of wild relatives. In terms of the genetic analysis, is a whole world uh, that uh, uh, you just need to get into the, the genetics and phenotype and genotype and then you calculate genetic diversity indices and also you need to understand the structure of the genetic uh, relations. Um, and for that, uh, you know, it's a whole, it's a different field, it's population genetics, right? That you really uh, have a lot of different ways of measuring genetic diversity. There are manuals, this is just information uh, that you, uh, you can do. Uh, we do not have a person specialized on this, at the, the university will be something I think especially useful now that we have especially the school of agronomy I think we will need a population genetics so that we eventually get uh, some publication like this one this is just an example for example uh, an example of genetic diversity and population structure of uh, oregano right oregano from Morocco using these markers and you get all these indices and that uh, really gives a uh, good information to, to for conservation strategies, right? 
this is just another example in which you get with the information you get a graphical relationship among the different uh, accessions right and you understand the the evolutionary history of this and um, just to finish the presentation i just wanted to tell you about uh, something that uh, we are already part of the report of Ecuador to the Sustainable Development Objectives. INEAP contacted us uh, a few months ago asking us if we still maintain the collection. We said yes, and then uh, we reported that to this. Um, I was just finished showing you our botanical garden where the collection is, and also, of course, always inviting you to visit this area uh, you, get to, you can know learn more about plants and the diversity therein thank you very much to everyone uh, and if there is any question uh, if there is, there is time or just feel free to email me uh, i'm happy to to respond or to talk about thank you so much hugo for your help um, so anybody who has questions can write on the chat um, and then uh, Hugo can can respond in order. Okay. Thank I have, you so much. have a question. Uh, Franz, maybe because sometimes the sound is not good, I, I, I advise you to write the question uh, so it's easier. Okay. And you can 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 listen and understand. Okay, um, Javier was asking whether uh, oca is attacked by pests like most common crops. Actually, uh, from what the literature says and that we what we have confirmed in the field, oca is a very strong, very strong uh, cultivar. Uh, even though sometimes you see some diseases, it is really um, you still get production. So it is not like potato. The problem with potato is that we have. Uh, industrialize it so much that in order to have a good production you need to add fertilizers and this and that pesticides and then you get a good crop yield but for oca that has not yet happened um, and uh, i think it has to do a lot with the oxalic acid i think it is by itself a very good uh, anti herbivorous um, uh, component but still you you get some pests sometimes you know this is a cusus, los cusos that eat the tuber, right? Or sometimes you get a little bit of fungi. But in general, if if the just with the typical ancestral uh, agricultural practices, uh, you get a good yield, and and the yield can be very very. You know, if you let's say you plant, if I remember well, I think uh, it's, a, it's like one to ten. So you plant, let's say one one kilogram, and you uh, you get. 10, 15 kilograms of, of oak. So that was the question for, for, for of Javier. Um, here I have another question. Uh, it says, in case that we would like to do artificial selection to improve the nutritional profile or to reduce oxalates, would it be possible to cross ocas that normally do not cross in nature because of the flower structure? Yes, that would be the uh, a good. Uh, a, a good uh, research experience, right? Um, what people do actually nowadays, they run uh, uh, they run this analysis that they call a GWAS, GWAS. And basically what you get there is that you uh, genotype uh, the, a population, right? Using markers and random markers all over. And eventually you identify the what uh, Part of, of the genome is responsible, to put it simple, it's responsible uh, for certain uh, phenotypes. So you kind of know uh, a little bit the relation between phenotype and phenotype, depending on the phenotype you're interested in. And then uh, once you get that profile, uh, joining the joining the, the genetics with the phenotype, right? You can go and, and do a more direct uh, breeding effort because in the past you only had uh, the phenotypes right and you keep mixing things but just looking at the phenotypes now we have the tools nowadays because of molecular advancements in molecular biology that you can have uh, you can 
uh, yeah, you can develop a more um, direct uh, breeding effort. Um, that I'm not sure we could do it uh, here in Ecuador. Usually, the, a little bit more advanced, uh, but uh, we can always look for collaboration. Um, yeah, but uh, plain, uh, you know, just typical uh, crossing, you can always, always do like our our, our farmers have have always done. So. Javier is asking, uh, can ocas be used for the industrial production of oxalates? Well, um, that uh, I think it depends on the variety. That would be interesting uh, to see, to assess, because there are varieties uh, that uh, have not have much oxalate, but a few have even up to 500 parts per million of oxalate, and that's a lot. And um, because a lot of it is in the tuber, and because the yield is very high, if you get a variety and, and you manage the crop very well, you will get a lot, a lot of tubers with very high uh, oxalate content that maybe could have uh, an industrial purpose uh, of oxalate extraction. And as we know, oxalates are used in different types of industries. Um, and um, so it will be something to try, but we need to first identify those varieties that have the highest oxalate content. So that was part, that is part actually of what we would like to do. If we get the funding, run some bromatological or chemical analysis more in depth for each variety that we have in the seed bank, not only our seed bank, but also the seed bank at uh, INIAP. But in theory, it should be possible, especially because of the high yield uh, that OCAS can have the very high amount of fibers that you can produce. Uh, in the field, so maybe an option. And Jocelyn is asking, I have heard that oca grows best in cold areas. Okay, indeed, but I tried to plant here in Ibarra and only the plant was produced, was produced, but no fruit. I guess what she means is no tuber, right? So can I consider that information, the cold areas is true? Yes, indeed, uh, evolutionarily speaking, because of the origin of the plant, because of the ancestors of the plants, of the plant, this is these are high altitude uh, plants that will grow will, will grow better uh, around above 3,000 meters, right? And uh, in Ibarra, I think it is 2,300 meters. If I'm not mistaken, we are a little below. We are like at Yachay, the same situation. What we have seen in at Yachay is that if you cover uh, the garden, no, the botanical garden, if we if you plant in a shade house and you they are, are a little bit, um, uh, you take care of the irrigation, uh, some varieties will develop okay. I mean, not as in the field, but they will develop enough to maintain the cultivar over time. Um, of course, if you go to, to, to the paramo, uh, you will get a better yield. I think there is a physiological history behind that. I haven't seen any publication about that, but uh, from what happens in other, in other plants, I think uh, you might need the, the signal, you know, the signal of the cold, you know, cold signal, uh, temperature signal for it to mature. Um, but, um, yeah, so in, I think it is possible. People uh, in England, uh, they planted in the house, in pots. Well, England is a different climate, but still it's in the house, but they still produce tubers at home. So it is possible. I would think. What is the best way to get rid of oxalates before, prior to eating the oka? Uh, well, what people do, I don't know what is the best way, but what people usually do, and maybe the best way is just what people usually do, in our, our indigenous people and farmers, they put the oka under the sun and, and for a week or so, and then uh, the Little by little, uh, they accumulate carbohydrates, the sugars, and I'm not sure if the oxalates go away, but at least you do not taste them anymore. And as I said uh, before, uh, you know, once you do not taste the oxalates, you kind of forget about them. We got to remember other foods have much more oxalates that we always eat, spinach, for example. So, um, that's what people do, just kind of forget about the oxalate a little bit. But it would be interesting to actually assess, like, 
different treatments to, to see how we could get rid of the oxalates prior to consumption. Um, that would, you know, those different treatments. But some varieties by it's themselves do not have much oxalate to begin with. Okay, uh, any more questions? Well, if there are no more questions, um, you know, uh, we have your email, we have your contact to go. Again, um, this video is going to be shared and uh, I'm sure uh, anybody can, can follow up. Thank you very much to people who, uh, who joined, the students, the professors. Thank you, Hugo, again. And, uh, Welcome. And uh, please continue to connect to our webinars. Uh, we have uh, some, some more interesting, uh, some additional webinars coming soon. Uh, please follow the schedule, uh, log in and, and, and continue to learn uh, through this platform. Thank you everybody, bye-bye. Thank you everybody.